Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I promise to be the low-budget, less polished version of Marcus's talk. Um, yeah, I've got video clips. Um, yeah, so I'm the environmental manager for Tablelands Mining Group. Um, I just thought we'd start with a picture of the Marillion Harbour port in which we do have a f export facility, uh, which is currently sort of um, unused at the moment. Um, but I thought we'd start off that and demonstrating that, that a pretty picture from a drone can actually also start help the communication process. So, as stated, um, I'm the environmental manager for Tablelands Mining Group. Uh, it's a relatively small iron ore company um, with a number of uh, uh, mine sites up on the Tablelands. We're currently doing resource development and uh, exploration uh, with, with no current operations active. Um, I thought I'd start off with a bit of a disclaimer. Um, this is not a corporate presentation, I'm not here representing the, the group, um, but uh, I just want to try and give you guys a bit of an idea uh, of the aspects of, of drone and, and GIS, how that applies to the environmental, environmental aspects of, of uh, management and mining. Um, it's a very small but very important part of, of what I do, um, and sometimes they're um, some fairly costly implications um, that the, the drone work can help with. So, caveat, not a GIS professional, um, probably not even a GIS practitioner. Um, I'm a user. I've worked out some things that can, can actually assist uh, me in my role. Uh, and it's something that I've taken on, not from a corporate perspective, but something that makes my job a lot easier. So that's why I do it. I'm basically a lazy person. So the other caveat is I'm not an expert in law. Uh, as Marcus um, mentioned, drone use is heavily regulated in Australia, so refer to CASA for more information. They're actually really good and very proactive in, in the drone space these days uh, and actually quite good to deal with. Good. So I'll give you a little bit of a background about uh, my journey into the, into the drone space. Um, it's not completely dissimilar to to Marcus, um, but probably uh, uh, noted by a little bit more uh, failure than success. So I'll go through the tools that I've used and how I've gotten to, to that place, um, how I use them, and I'll talk a, probably in a little bit more detail about the specific workflow that I use to, to get the stuff that's of uh, use to me. Um, it's, it's an exercise in expedience rather than um, any other driver. Uh, I'll go through the outputs that I find useful uh, what I've used those outputs for, and then we can talk about questions, but I'm happy to answer anything that pops up along the way. So, this was the first drone I purchased, um, and um, it was a it was a bit of a beast, and uh, as Marcus said, back in those days, you, you put them together. Um, it was a custom build. Everything had to be done. There was no such thing as telemetry. Uh, yeah, if you wanted that, you had to add that. Even getting a visual out of it um, was um, something that you had to uh, build in a, in a custom fashion. Um, I was getting around about sort of 10 minutes flight time out of this. Um, uh, everything about it was difficult, so, and it wasn't a, a trivial investment for me personally, because uh, it was interest, so I thought I'll go and teach myself to fly on one of the base model. Uh, this is the 
the very earliest uh, phantom drone uh, back, what, 2012, Marcus, somewhere in that era. Um, um, used a GoPro, didn't have a custom camera. If you wanted to put a, a gimbal on it, it was a $1,000 extra. Um, and again, no telemetry, so you'd set the GoPro off taking pictures and off you'd fly and hope you'd come back with, with something at the end of it. Um, it was all line of sight visual. You didn't have a screen to look at. So um, after using that for a little while, um, I, I kind of discovered that the, um, the big drone was just terrifying to fly. Um, none of the systems, it, it used a proprietary DJI flight controller which wasn't very advanced then. Um, it had some good features like if a motor went out it would try and save itself but that was more of a controlled crash than, than, than a um, res resumption of, of controlled flight. Um, so on the basis that it was terrifying to fly in some of the flights where I was trying to teach myself how to fly the thing, um, I'd go to a local RC club and, and they, uh, after a couple of weeks, uh, politely asked me to not come along anymore because uh, it scared them. So we then pursued the, the DJI drones and it was much, much easier to, to fly. Um, at some point I discovered the Phantom 3 uh, gave me more flight time, I had up to 20 minutes of flight time, I had telemetry, yee-haw, uh, that was a, a wonderful innovation. Um, and about that same time I discovered a company called Maps Made Easy which at that point in time were in development of software to, to do mapping and um, I contacted them and they invited me to be a beta tester of the software. Uh, so then commenced uh, probably a couple of years of beta testing before they released a commercial product but uh, I decided that that was the way I'd like to go. So what I've ended up with is Maps Made Easy have a product called Map Pilot, which is your flight planning software. Uh, that together with the drone I've now settled on is the um, Phantom 4 uh, which gives a good 25, 26 minutes usable flight time with a 30 minute um, theoretical flight time. Uh, obstacle avoidance, it's just made life so much easier. It's a way more stable platform than, than any of its predecessors uh, in terms of simplicity to fly. has a bunch of features that um, can also be used for other, other things, just standard videography. We'll track a, a moving vehicle or person beyond what I need for mapping. 20 megapixel camera and the key for the photogrammetry aspect is that it's got a mechanical shutter um, which the, all the previous cameras, the GoPro stuff and the previous DJI ones had a rolling shutter uh, like a lot of digital um, phone cameras so it's not an actual mechanical shutter which can cause problems if you're taking photos as you're moving along. So then to process uh, the Maps Made Easy um, capture has a, a, a portal, uh, as Marcus was referring to, there's a bunch of these but this was the one that I'd done beta testing for, I was comfortable with it and decided to pursue with. It's still a model that suits me very well um, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail uh, and that's largely because of the very, very few occasions that I actually do use it. And then for an, uh, the analysis end, QGIS is my go-to because um, it's simple, easy and free. Uh, and I do use on a few, for a few things, just Google Earth, um, simplicity and, and cheapness. Seems to be doing it. 
doing too much, okay? sound yeah, yeah so there is a narration of this but basically you can see what it is this is your flight planning and it's really simply touch the screen to define your area expand it till you want I have a slightly different process in this because uh, a lot of what I'm doing is uh, defined by a mining lease I'll import um, that polygon into the software prior to doing the planning so uh, in a small lease I can precisely make sure that I cover everything on the lease but essentially the process is the same you set your parameters what sort of overlap you're after um, 70 to 80 percent depending on what you're actually the, the terrain you're in um, and then once you've actually done all that all this can be done in the office prior to, to going to site which for me is quite important because um, a lot of my sites are large distances away so this is all done in advance and then you save that mission uh, to be used at a later date and in some cases where I've done multiple revisits of, of the one place you just relay the same mission um, and away you go again. So then once you've gone to site, you simply launch the vehicle and it, it will do the overlap, fly the path and hopefully in, in most cases come home. Um, I think those of, those of us who have been doing it for a while have all had um, is it coming back moments. Um, most of mine have revolved around, yeah, I think I can push the battery just this little bit, this one last leg. Um, and I've had drones on the side of waste rock dumps and in pits and things like that. But you, you start to learn that lesson that, um, that uh, yeah, better to come back and change the battery and take a little bit longer than to um, risk lose, losing your expensive gear. I should point out that also in Map Pilot, it does have the feature for multi-battery missions just to run automatically. You can set parameters where at a certain level of battery, it'll um, abandon the mission, come back, you change the battery, simply restart it, it'll go back out to where it, where it got to and just refly. And as far as I know, that's almost infinite. I typically don't do more than three or four batteries at a time. Usually I try and keep it to one for simplicity if I can in a small area. I get around about 10 hectares per battery-ish. So then we'll move on to the processing. Uh, as I said, the model in Maps Made Easy suits me. It's a simple pay in advance point system. Um, I think every data set under a gigabyte total, they'll process for free. So you can see in that list, that's my points list. You can see some jobs have been processed for free. Small jobs, you can actually do it zero zero cost for processing. It's pretty reasonable and economical to, to just um, buy points and, and work them off. Um, you know, there's no real big jobs in that lot, um, but um, you know, you can manage that quite, quite easily um, in advance. And I do know of people that break up their jobs into multiple smaller jobs, but um, to try and just get it for free but I think that's a false economy in the long run because you spend more time than joining everything together. So that model suits me well because as you can see from that I don't actually do a lot of it. 
So the process then is you can simply upload your photos, walk away, um, and then you'll come back, just like the drone deploy stuff that uh, Marcus illustrated, uh, you can come back and when you get an email saying your job's ready, uh, it will be. Uh, typically that's in, within 24 hours in most cases, but for me, the best part about that is I don't have to know anything about actually processing those images and that just someone else's expertise uh, benefits me. So when you get your email, you'll come back and at the top of your screen will be an image like this. So you can confirm that the, the drone has captured imagery uh, in the area of your interest. The blue spots in that case, occasion are ground control points that I've had surveyed in. Um, really useful, particularly doing, if you're doing elevation work, to, to get uh, those ground control points. All it simply does is... Um, through a stretch process, um, calibrate the, um, the digital elevation model aspect and also the, the, the orthophoto to the actual ground control. So you get pretty high precision in this. Um, I won't quote a number on that, but um, it, it's certainly well in excess of my needs for the aspects that I look at. So also part of, of what you see in your output page uh, is, is this and hopefully it looks like this. So this is just simply an overlap report. So you can see in the blue areas there's um, a large number of images. So what you're hoping to see in this is, is uh, through the centre of your area of interest that you've got full. The white areas are just simply um, artefacts where it, it it does actually have that, that full image density. Um, but what you don't want, and it's a little bit of a trap for young players, such as myself, the part of the planning software is you can actually get it to execute uh, terrain following, where it uses SRTM data to, to um, determine what the ground surface is like. But particularly on mine sites, miners have a habit of moving large amounts of dirt around. Um, and in this instance, what they had done is they'd filled in a, a gully um, and I hadn't picked up that that was the case. This was uh, my first mission at this site um, and the site had previously operated. Uh, so but basically here I've just ended up with a bunch of stuff that is not very useful. Um, sure, useful for all the other aspects, but in that area I've got a huge data gap with essentially no information of any use whatsoever. So the way I addressed that was actually just not to use the terrain following and just set it at an altitude that was going to make sure I had overlap coverage over the whole area. So these are the quite uh, extensive outputs that are generated uh, by Maps Made Easy. Uh, I don't use all of these. Um, I use a few, which I'll go into in the next slide. But it has everything from point, point cloud data XYZ format, uh, geotiffs, uh, colourised um, representations, which I, I do find useful, and and a, a Google Earth KMZ file which can be brought into Google Earth, Google Earth and, and viewed in 3D. So from there, move along the flow path. Um, use QGIS for all the GIS goodness uh, that is available from there. It really is almost limitless what you can do with that data once you've got it. Um, and then pretty much I will use Google Earth for, for simple stuff. Sometimes I'll bring in the GeoTIFF into Google Earth just to get a good plan view that I can share with other people. That's the really good thing about the um, KMZ files that you can get in. They're you know, 
most people have access to Google Earth and can easily do it without anything special and, and nothing special on my part, which is probably the bit I like the best. And I'm constantly surprised just how often I use that um, I won't even bother going into this. This is just similar to what Marx says, it's a 3D representation that you can scroll around, move, view things, get an idea of how the site actually looks in person without being there. For me, this is really, really useful, even from my own point of view, because one of the th tasks that I do um, uh, afterwards in many cases is I'll uh, determine what the land use is in any given thing, so quite often a little bit of a zoom in and and turn around can, can give you a, a better concept of where particular features are going and, and flow. And uh, especially since COVID, where um, you know, getting, getting consultants from Brisbane and uh, other parts is difficult, and you might be dealing with someone you know, the other side of the country, um, you can send them this and they can effectively fly around the site uh, at, at will to get a bit of an idea of just the layout. And, I find that tremendously useful um, in, in communicating the particular aspects. So the other, as the other outputs that I uh, regularly use, the, the colourised uh, DM is, is not something that's geo-referenced or anything, but it's just a kind of useful, quick, uh, appreciation of what the elevation is doing on site. You can see it's going from blue uh, down in the lower parts to in, in this site there's, there's quite a pronounced hill. Um, and the red sites, and you'll have noticed in the 3D model before. It produces a full geo-reference DEM, digital elevation model, uh, which is one of the things I use a lot um, for a variety of tasks, um, and a geo-tiff, um, which then um, falls into all, all the mapping type aspects in, in a very high resolution. Typically, uh, when I fly a mission, I'll fly around the 100, 120 metre mark, which is within the CASA uh, limits without special permissions. Um, with the 20 megapixel camera, I'm getting around about two, two and a bit centimetres per pixel. So that's the level of resolution. So you can pretty easily pick up a feature in the five to 10 centimetre range. So the, the GeoTIFF, um, one of the uh, extremely useful aspects uh, in the environmental world, in mining in particular, um, is a land use classification, which might seem unusual, but um, part of the requirements for having a mine is that you have um, funding for rehabilitation uh, in the form of a bond, now called estimated rehabilitation cost. So you essentially have to work out what the cost of rehabilitating the entire site is, um, and you uh, have a bond with the government where you usually are cash-backed Thing. So you'll deposit um, an amount of money which is designed to, to rehabilitate the site in the event that the mining company goes belly up in the future. Uh, this varies from company to company. I've administered uh, ERCs of in excess of uh, $30 million. Um, there are some land features in mining that you have a mandatory cost you must allow for. So that cost can be um, $170,000 a hectare. So as you can imagine, mapping that precisely can have a significant effect on the total cost. And there's been occasions where um, we've gone from, uh, some companies actually would have even used Google, old Google Earth imagery to do this job. Um, and so bringing in the precision of a drone enables you to that's quite extraordinary, um, um, to, to map it at a way higher precision. 
Uh, other uses, like uh, similar to Marcus's paddocks, um, there's uh, this is a, a heap leach, so pre-wet season, I would go and uh, fly a drain image. There's, a, there's quite a large um, uh, area, 65 hectares. So as you can imagine, saving a little bit in the area in those ERC calculations is very, very valuable. I've saved you know, hundreds of over, over six figures in that space. And you then target what needs to be repaired prior to the wet season for your water management. This was a tailings uh, facility that was leaking. So um, simply mapped the wall and where the leaks were. Um, we went from uh, a rough mud map to actually being able to precisely map areas where there was standing water, damp soil. Um, you would then go out and ground truth these to get a bit of an idea if you're doing it right. But essentially um, it made a higher precision and, and better reporting uh, of these leakages. You can see here, in, in a temporal sense, once you've started collecting that data, uh, probably most of it by looking in, in within the tailings dam itself, you can see it drying out. That effect was replicated on the outside as the control measures to control the leak actually worked. So I pass on all of this data to consultants that work for us, uh, particularly designing water management around mine sites, which is a big thing. Um, so by doing flow analysis, we can then um, picture where we need to put controls and additional work in. We do dam volumes, uh, feeds into water balances, it just flows on and on and on. So beyond uh, just purely environmental needs and GIS, incident investigations uh, for mapping spill extents and all those sorts of things that can be used. Um, and in the mining game, uh, you can help people by just making a good follower of yourself by giving them this data. Rehabilitation monitoring, similar to what Marcus had in, in the um, sense, it's of great use. And certainly multispectral would have a, a big um, part to play in, in that. Um, stockpile assessments, the miners love it when you're not sending a surveyor up a, a uh, rocky stockpile that can be dangerous to work on. Uh, you can do it faster, quicker, cheaper and better um, using the drone. And inspections of hazardous areas. I've been in a case where um, I sent a drone into a pit where there was a breakthrough blast with underground operations. So we sent the drone in first just to inspect that it was safe to send people in there later on. And of course, then all the fun GIS things you do as part of that. And that's it. Thank you. that they will process. Uh, yes, there is, and I have hit it on one occasion, but I can't recall what that is off the top of my head. Uh, certainly, something like that, yeah. It, it is a big number, and I've only ever hit it once. Um, um, yeah, it is something like 10,000 images. Correct, yes. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, in mine sites, like I've tried doing some, some uh, auto classification previously, but there's a lot of bare dirt on a mine site, and the bare dirt looks like the bare dirt next to it, and they might have completely different land uses. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, all, all just hand um, digitised um, for that. If you get you get quick at it after a while. Thank you.